what happened in church history, the large Messianic Jewish community compared it to the small Gentile believing community. The Jews gave the Gentiles freedom to be Gentiles and they began, they, they received the gospel and began to spread. So what happened three, 400 years later, now the church, the body of Christ, the body of Messiah is predominantly Gentile with relatively, uh, you know, proportionately smaller Jewish believers and what happens? They're coming together in councils and what the, the Gentiles are coming together and say, what do we do now with these Jews who are getting saved? The exact opposite of Acts 15. And rather than remembering the kindness of Acts 15, where the Gentiles were released to be themselves in the gospel, they, they did not remember that kindness. This was the first real divisional wound of mm. the body of Messiah. The consequences are very, very far reaching and destructive and of course it has created 30,000 different kinds of uh, denominations in Christianity. There is no other way for the followers of, of Yeshua to be united but to get back to the roots. So uprooting the replacement theology is not so much about dealing with theology, yes it is, but we must come and humble ourselves and say God forgive us our pride and therefore if we are healing the first wound when the problem started then all the other things will be more quickly healed and the only way to heal it is to repair the first uh, split between uh, the Gentile or Gentilized church and, and a Jewish part of the church. For centuries, it was not possible to think about it because for centuries, there was no Jewish expression, which was even there as a possible partner for the Gentile leadership to deal with. But since God has resurrected the Messianic Jew Jewish movement, which I would call the Jewish part of the church in a nutshell. Since this time, there is a possibility to heal the broken body and to really go deep into this dimension of, of bringing together Jew and Gentile into one man. We have no evidence of there being communities of Jewish believers in Yeshua who continued to live as Jews for 1400 years. In the 18th century, we have the first evidence of a kind of restoration of the Messianic Jewish community take place. Count Zinzendorf had a vision for reaching out to Jewish people with the good news of Yeshua and, and inviting them after becoming followers of Yeshua to continue to live as Jews, uh, encouraging them that this is part of their calling, uh, affirming their covenant relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now understand that the Messianic Judaism is back in a bigger way, especially since the rebirth of Israel in 48, and then the taking of Jerusalem, having Jerusalem, many people don't realize this, but it was even during Yeshua's time, they did not, they did not have sovereignty of rule over Israel. And so it's only the first time that they had that, especially over Jerusalem, was in 1967 that they got that back to have sovereignty as a nation 
over Jerusalem and over all of Israel. So there's been things that have happened with the healing of the body. We, we recognize that the Jesus movement that started was in the 60s. Interesting time that the charismatic renewal started at that same time. A lot of large things happened in the Catholic community that the Protestant churches didn't even hear about. We didn't even know. And yet there was something God was doing worldwide. In addition to that renewal taking place from within the church, there was also a uh, an outpouring of God's Spirit that took place in the 1960s and 70s in which Jewish people who were not part of the church, just God sovereignly poured out His Spirit on young Jewish people uh, during that time to the point that thousands of, of young Jewish people suddenly became followers of Yeshua and over time began to connect with each other and caught a vision for forming communities. I was born and raised in a Jewish home. My parents are Holocaust survivors, and I was brought up in a very uh, sheltered manner. I was brought up to never, ever consider Jesus or Christianity as something that we would be interested in or should even explore. When I began to hear from different people at various times in my life that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, I would just simply write them off and I wouldn't accept it. But it began to really penetrate my thinking and I I began to consider, who is this Jesus? I went out and I read some of the New Testament. I read uh, uh, some books that spoke about Jesus or taught about Jesus, who he is. And I thought, well, you know, I think actually Jesus was a very unique person and I, might, I probably would have liked him. But he's not the Messiah, certainly not the Messiah, not the Jewish Messiah. And when I was contemplating this, I was all alone, all by myself. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, a power fell upon me. I look now back upon that moment, and I can tell you it was the power of the Holy Spirit. And it was like scales began to fall from my eyes. I began to weep and cry, and my eyes began to see things that I had never seen before, like a heavenly, like like a heavenly vision and who Yeshua Jesus really is. And all I could do and all I could say, Jesus is for real. And that began my journey of exploration and delving into an intimate relationship with Jesus because now I went from rejecting him to accepting and believing that he really is the Jewish Messiah. He really is the one who God promised to the people of Israel as a deliverer and as our savior, Messiah. And I journeyed and explored and I read the scriptures over and over and over again from back to the front, from front to back. So when it came to the point of wondering what what do I where do I fit I'm a Jew how do you know I don't fit in the church that's not my thing and I don't fit in Christianity and I can't even call myself a Christian because it's just it was it, it was just so ingrained in me to be a Jew and you know that the Jews and the Christians just don't come together like that spiritually and I really needed to know if a Jew could even fit in the New Testament I know that sounds funny, but I had no idea the New Testament was a Jewish book. I began to really understand the New Testament as a Jewish book. And when I understood it as a Jewish book, I started to read it as a Jew, and I started to see things in the New Testament that are so Jewish. And I began to interpret the New Testament in a very Jewish way. That encouraged me greatly. I finally felt like I found a place 
for myself as a Jew in the New Testament. But what about Gentiles? <laughs> where was a gen where, where where did the Gentiles fit? Where did where did Christians fit? And uh, I didn't know, didn't know the answer to that. I I actually stayed in my own Jewish world as a follower of Jesus. I I visited churches and I even spoke in churches sometimes. Uh, but I couldn't remain in the church. I couldn't live in the church because it wasn't me. Yes, uh, I was born in Jaffa, Tel Aviv. I'm a native Israeli, uh, raised here in, in Tel Aviv, Israel, and finished high school. Then I went to the army. I was uh, four years in the Israeli Air Force. And when I finished my duty, I went to America to explore America. And on my way to Las Vegas, I have come to know the Lord and became a believer, got married. And uh, then I went to Bible school in Dallas. And uh, after this, I just knew I want to come back home and do one thing, share the gospel, make disciples, and come back home, Tel Aviv, Israel, and uh, do the work of the ministry. So these individuals who experienced an encounter with God through the Holy Spirit in the 1960s and 70s began to connect with each other and form communities in which they could continue to live out their Jewish identities in a communal context. So they formed Messianic synagogues and for the most part didn't know uh, that others were doing the same thing in other parts of this country and other parts of the world. It was truly a grassroots movement in which Messianic Jewish congregations just began popping up all over the world to the place where today we have over 500 Messianic synagogues around the world. In addition, as uh, the years went by, more and more Jews became followers of Yeshua within Gentile churches. So that today, there are probably over a million Jewish people in the churches who believe in Yeshua. And I began now to wonder how do Jews and Gentiles react to one another? How do Jews and Gentiles who are followers of Jesus live together if, if we're supposed to live together? How do we do that? Well, this began this journey of exploration into what is now called Toward Jerusalem Council II. It began a process in my own mind and in my own heart of reconciliation. I had not much love for Christianity. I had, I had to be, my heart had to be broken in order for me to begin to see Christians as part of my family and I part of their family. In 1995, I was speaking at a conference of the Mid-Atlantic Leadership Conference, and one of our speakers was John Dawson. He later became the president of YWAM, Youth with a Mission. And he was speaking on the topic of mutual repentance and when different ethnic groups who are believers repent for the sins done by their ethnic group against the other and they reconcile, it had an effect on opening up evangelism in that particular area. Of course, most of his stories were from Asia, but he had some stories from California when he lived in Los Angeles as well. And he wrote a book on that called Healing uh, America's Wounds. Well, it was very interesting that he was speaking on the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And so toward the end of the conference, I approached him and I said, John, you didn't say anything about Jewish people. And uh, this is a big wound between the Jewish people and the church. And John said, I can't believe I didn't mention that because it's in my book. And he said, the wound between the Jewish people, Israel and the church is the greatest wound in history. And I said to him, what you said about healing and reconciliation by the believers who are representatives on both sides of that rift, having repentance and reconciliation would open up the door to the progress of the kingdom of God both ways and we could do this if you would bring together leaders of the church and I could bring together leaders of the Messianic Jewish movement. 
we could have a conference where we would do this. John was very interested and he said, well, write me a letter on this when you get home and we'll see if we can follow up on it, put it into writing. And so I came home and um, was reflecting on it. Not long after that, Father Peter Hawken came into my office in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And he said to me, Dan, I have written a new book called The Glory and the Shame. Now, Peter Hawken is a Catholic priest theologian, charismatic Catholic, who was uh, part of the Mother of God Catholic charismatic community in Gaithersburg. And in The Glory and the Shame, he had a section where he just was anticipating the Tor Jerusalem Council to division. He said, the prayer of Jesus is for the unity of the church, but we cannot come to unity until we deal with the first church split. And the first church split was the church rejection of the Messianic Jewish community going back to the second century. And if we're going to see the church come into unity, they will have to deal with that split. And the Messianic Jewish community was raised up to be distinct, to be independent from other church streams, so that all of the streams of the church could relate to it, repent, and come into reconciliation. And that will be a key for the unity of the church and the progress of the gospel and the fulfillment of the prayer of Jesus that we might be one. As the president of the UMJC, I was invited to be the main speaker at one of the UMJC conferences. And so I began to study the scriptures in my upper room. And one of the scriptures I was studying was Acts chapter 15. Why I was studying Acts 15, I'm not exactly even sure. I think it was just, I was being led by the Spirit of God and I was studying Acts 15. I was studying Ephesians 2 and 3, Romans 9, 10 and 11, and other related scriptures. This is not just a couple hours of study. I've been studying for two days in my upper room. And, and uh, t the next day we were supposed to leave for the conference. So I go down from my upper room into the house and my wife's in the kitchen. And I said, Marlene, I'm, we're supposed to leave tomorrow for the conference. I've been studying for two days. I've got all this raw material, but I don't have a message. My wife, I guess she had a lot of confidence in me uh, as a public speaker, I don't know, or as a, as a student of the Lord and his word. She says, oh, I'm not worried about you. Which is not what I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear her say, oh, I'll start to pray for you, you know, <laughs> which she did say later. And um, so I went back upstairs. She says, I'll pray for you. I went back upstairs. When I went upstairs this time, it was in the afternoon, and I began to try to study again, but I was started, I just, I had studied so much already, I just began to cry out to the Lord. Lord, I've got all this raw material. Here's your word before me, you know, and it's in my heart, but what's, what's the message that you want to bring to this conference? And in response to my crying out to him, I began to feel the presence of the Lord fill the room and come upon me. I began to weep and I couldn't, I, I couldn't stand under the presence of the Lord. My head just went down on the desk and, and I wept and I wept and I wept before the Lord and the Lord began to pull all of this material, not just the notes and stuff, but probably my whole life and my devotion to him as it was, pull it together and bring to me this vision of a second Jerusalem council born out of what I had been studying in Acts 15 and the, the obedience that we were called to, that I was called to, to fulfill Ephesians chapters 2 and 3 and Romans 11. Uh, to, to recreate or restore, see the restoration of the olive tree vision of Jews and Gentiles living together in one tree. 
What he was showing me was the connection that I mentioned uh, about the ultimate fulfillment of the destiny of humanity uh, when Yeshua returns and how the Jewish people will be saved. Not just that the Jewish people will be saved, but how the Jewish people will be saved. And it will not come through just the testimony of other Jewish believers like me, but it will, be, it will come through how it was designed to come through Gentile Christians making us jealous, jealous for a relationship with the Lord, jealous for the heart of God. And, um, and that hasn't happened for 1,700 years or more, uh, and it needed to happen. And then the floodgates, the floodgates would just open up to Jewish evangelism. I had a call from Marty Waldman, Rabbi Marty Waldman, the leader of Baruch Hashem Congregation in Dallas, who said the Lord had given him a vision, and he at that time called it Jerusalem Council II, that we were to have a council of all the church leaders that we could gather from different streams and to bring them together in Jerusalem to have repentance and reconciliation with the Messianic Jewish leadership and that uh, to make official declaration about embracing the call, the distinctive irrevocable call of the Messianic Jews uh, and the Messianic Jewish congregations and that um, he believed that this would lead to a great step forward in the progress. I said to him, I can't believe that you're telling me this. And I told him the story of what I had just experienced with John Dawson and Peter Hawken. But I mentioned the vision to a few of the Messianic Jewish leaders at the conference. They, each one of them in their turn said, wow, Marty, this is from the Lord. And so I came home, began to pray about it. I felt like the Lord was saying to me, you know, you need to have some Christians confirm it to you. So I had some real Christians confirm it to me and uh, who were not part of the Messianic movement. And so Marty said, well, the Lord told him that he was to fly to Jerusalem where Jack Hayford was being sponsored by the Sokorans for a conference for leaders and that he was to present this vision to Jack Hayford. And if Jack Hayford endorsed it strongly, then that would be a sign to him to go with it. This is back when Pastor Jack Hayford was known globally. I mean, he was in his prime and he had radio, he had a radio show and it went all around the world and, uh, you know, pastor of a huge church in, in California. I said, Lord, I don't know Pastor Jack Hayford. In fact, I don't even know anybody who knows Pastor Jack Hayford. How do I get in touch with Pastor Jack Hayford? And so I, I get home, I walk in the front door and the phone rings. Who is it on the phone? It's my friend in Israel, Ari Sorkaram. And Ari was gathering the first Messianic Jewish Leaders Conference in Israel. And he said, Marty, I only have one seat left and I'd like you to have it. Um, and I said, you know, Ari, I'm really busy. I don't have the budget for this you know, another a trip to Israel, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, okay, well, please pray about it. Um, I'm gonna hold that seat for a little while just for you. Uh, I just want you to know that Pastor Jack Hayford is our main speaker. And I said, what? <laughs> this is right after I came back and felt like the Lord said to me, you know, I need to have it confirmed by Jack Hayford. So I accepted the invitation and so he presented this after that to the executives of the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations. I was an executive at that time, and there were four of us. He presented it to us, and uh, he was the president of the UMJC at that time. And we all said, we believe this is from God, and the UMJC paid for him to go. I met Jack, Pastor Jack, for lunch, and I shared with him the vision. I had written it on a piece of paper, typed it out on a piece of paper. So Jack read the document that I wrote. And he says, Marty, this is from God. I completely endorse TJC2 and the vision. And anywhere you go, you can use my name 
If it opens a door, great. But that gave me a great confidence that this was of the Lord. From there, the vision began to spread. I, I just shared it a couple of times in churches. Well, um, I was at the heart to share the gospel with the Jewish people, but also um, I had always had the heart to see also people from the nations coming to salvation and basically coming together with the Jewish believers and forming the one new man. So um, from, I'm talking uh, 35 years ago, uh, when um, I met my dear friend Ilan Zamir, who died and went to be with the Lord, uh, he shared with me more and more about the one new man vision. And then he shared with me that he met uh, uh, Madi Waldman from Dallas. And I knew Madi Waldman because he was my leader, my spiritual leader when I was a student at Bible school in Dallas. And, um, and the more I knew about it, the more I want to be involved uh, to, to bring back the, the wholeness of the one new man. So uh, from, from the early years, from the early years, I knew that um, this is something that I want to be involved and support. And that's the beginnings of Tour Jerusalem Council too. Not long after that, we got endorsements of it from the uh, Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations, the Messianic Jewish Alliance, and we had our first meeting of the leadership team, which included Peter Hocken and John Dawson and many others that we brought together, both Jews and Gentiles, in those first meetings in 1996. So that was an amazing time of beginnings. So when I say I'm a co-founder, it's because without, the, without all these other people coming around, TJC2 never would have been founded. I believe the vision of the Second Council is since we have seen more and more Jews coming to salvation in Israel, but also all over the world, that it's really time for the believers from the international body of Christ all over the world not to impose on the Jewish people to become like them. Let's say if you come from a Baptist church, oh, you have to become Baptist. If you come from an uh, Orthodox church, you have to become an Orthodox. Or if you uh, Church of Christ, now you have to become Church of Christ. I believe that it's time for the believers from all those churches that are believers and following the Lord. And when they share the good news with the Jewish people, they come to salvation to allow the Jewish people to be Jews. You know, we have a beautiful uh, uh, heritage, beautiful traditions, uh, biblical feasts that we enjoy. And I think uh, it's, uh, this is our identity. And when we become believers, of course, we become a new creation in the Messiah Yeshua, but it doesn't mean that we have to cut off our roots. And uh, that's basically, the, the second council is like the first council, where most of the church that is mostly Gentile, welcoming the Jewish people as they are into the body uh, and together forming the one new man. I think the original schism, the original split in the body of Messiah, which is now called the church, was between Jews and Gentiles. And that was a wound that has yet to be healed. TJC two is in the process of bringing that into focus and allowing the Lord to bring healing to that wound by bringing reconciliation between Jews and Gentiles and healing the split, healing the schism. It's been my experience at Volva TJC too, that there's something about the Messianic Jew that is very unifying because when people begin to embrace their Messianic Jewish brother, people who would never get in a room together before. Something about Messianic Jews, it's like the glue that holds it together in mm -hmm. TJC too, because I think people see the, the biblical basis of it, they see the theology of it, but I think there's something supernatural by the Spirit of God that does bring uh, Gentiles together of different faiths when it centers around the Messianic Jewish cause and the res restoration of the Messianic Jew, the restoration of the Jewish people. So this is at the very heart of TJC too. Well, there's a passage, passage in uh, in Ezekiel 
that we've talked about quite a bit, that when God is honored, then the nations round about will know that I am the Lord. So there's something about the, the Jewish people as they come to know him that's going to affect all the nations around, every nation in the world. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So let me put this in perspective to those who say that the Jews were rejected because their hearts were hardened. The fact is that their hearts were hardened so that us Gentiles could be brought into the kingdom of God. And when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, their hearts will be unhardened so that all of Israel will be saved. And when I say that, I don't mean in a dual covenant theology because the Bible is clear in, in Acts 4, 11 through 12, this Yeshua has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. 